Zwei Group invites all AEC industry leaders to the 2024 AEC Small Business and Entrepreneurship Forum, the premier event for small firms in the AEC sector. Experience innovative strategies and insights on May 21st, crafted by Zweig Group's industry experts. Engage in keynotes and interactive sessions focused on recruitment, retention, and business growth. Join Zwei Group for this unique networking opportunity and take your business to new heights. Secure your spot today and be part of the AEC industry's future. Visit ZweigGroup.com for more information. The Zwei Group team looks forward to welcoming you. Welcome to the Zweig Letter Podcast, putting architectural, engineering, planning, and environmental consulting advice and guidance in your ear. Zweig Group's team of experts have spent more than three decades elevating the industry by helping AEP and environmental consulting firms thrive. And these podcasts deliver invaluable management, industry, client, marketing, and HR advice directly to you, free of charge. The Zweig Letter Podcasts, elevating the design industry one episode at a time. Harry Clark is a highly awarded serial entrepreneur, business advisor, board member, and keynote speaker on entrepreneurship. He was the founder and CEO of two Inc. 500 companies, awarded Entrepreneur of the Year, and has had two exits. He was formerly the CEO and co-founder of a modular design, build, and development company. He grew up from a startup to $100 million and 450 employees in just five years. The company earned its ranking on the Inc. 500, which, by the way, for those of you who don't know, Hot Firm was actually modeled after the Inc. 500. Harry is the best-selling author of Mistakes Millionaires Make, a book that stands apart from the rest with its fortune-saving recommendations and insights into the risk that all entrepreneurs face every day. You don't have to be or have millions to walk away with practical advice for living a better financial future and to maximize the value in your firm. His book and the talk he is about to deliver will certainly drive that home. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Harry Clark to the Elevate stage. Well, the uh, information you just received this morning was like drinking from a fire hose, (laughs) but excellent information for sure. So happy to be here. So historically, 80% of all businesses, including Fortune 500 companies, fail. The difference is the pizza parlor fails in a couple of years, Fortune 500 companies fail between 20 and 40 years. According to a McKinsey study, with today's disruption, 75% of all existing businesses today will disappear within 10 years. So um, according to the survey that we took, um, you, you, uh, you represent 44% entrepreneurs, uh, 58% hired executives. Interestingly, uh, no family business, which I would, I would assume that within 10 years, you might start seeing some more family business transitions. Now, it's the mindset of an entrepreneur to say, we won't fail, no way. We've engineered out all of the risk. There's no way that we can fail. Well, let me tell you my story. I had it made. I had the best education an entrepreneur could wish for. Um, I sharpened my sword at the best entrepreneurship programs in the world, pretty much every single education program. Founded two Inc. 500 companies, 
By 2005, I had uh, 450 employees and a personal net worth of $100 million. Everything I touched turned to gold, or so I thought. I lost everything. My, most importantly, my 450 team members who were amazing people all lost their jobs with devastating impact to their communities, their families. The $100 million evaporated. My, uh, the impact to vendors and customers was also devastating. My, uh, my marriage of 20 years ended up in divorce, and one of my daughters attempted suicide twice because of that, and we almost lost her. So let me, let me take you back. Um, I'm, uh, after grad school, worked at Deloitte as a consultant. Um, and uh, uh, my, the manager that hired me out of grad school uh, was a, a partner, a principal in a public municipal finance company. Uh, so he brought me on. Um, and within a couple of years, they made me a partnership offer. We couldn't agree to terms, so I left. Um, and uh, it was basically providing all the back office and systems for, uh, to administer municipal debt. So I, we grew that over seven years to be the largest in the United States, providing services you know, across, across the country. After seven years, um, a, a Fortune 100 company came to us. They wanted to buy us. We negotiated back and forth. Um, and I ended up selling the company to them for a huge pile of cash. We were set for life. We set up a, f a full elaborate estate plan, LLCs for every asset over a million dollars. We did most all of the right things. The, I stayed with them for two years as a senior officer. Um, uh, very exciting. I didn't think I'd last two years, but I did. Amazing. Um, after the second year, had the entrepreneurial itch again. And so I looked at 13 different uh, business opportunities with an emphasis on doing good and doing well, but really wanted to make a difference in the world. The 13th opportunity would really fit that perfectly. So in the state of California, <clears throat> where, I, where I was based, um, half of all of the school kids spent their days in rickety portable trailers. And, and yet there was, still, there was funding available, but it was so inefficient building schools. So with, with five other people, we uh, went to a resort much like this, huge whiteboard, and we listed all of the problems associated with new school delivery. We engineered what we thought was the perfect solution to each and every one of those problems, and we called it turnkey. So it was a fully integrated design build, so we did uh, planning, finance, um, land acquisition, uh, a, we built a, a manufacturing plant. We did all steel modular construction. About 60% of the construction was done in the manufacturing plant. And then we, we uh, uh, built the schools. Great, just a fantastic business model. First year, uh, with five of us, we did $7 million in, in uh, revenue. Second year, $15 million. Third year, $25 million. Fourth year, $50 million. Fifth year, $100 million in sales with a $200 million backlog. It was fantastic. We were building a billion-dollar company. We were putting in place all the systems, all the right people, building a fantastic culture, trying to make a difference. 
at about 50 million in sales, I started getting a little uncomfortable because my estate plan did not take into consideration having this rocket ship. And I had all the personal guarantees for bonding, for, for the bank loans. So here we have this elaborate estate plan. We have this rocket ship with my liability just skyrocketing. So at 50 million, I, for the first time, hired a CFO. Uh, his name was Philippe. And uh, uh, Philippe was fantastic. Very, very uh, good background overall. And um, so I, I told Philippe, let's raise $20 million to put on the balance sheet. So he goes out, we hire an a investment banker, we have five private equity offers, $20 million for a 20% equity stake. Yes, $100 million valuation after five years, we're, we're excited about it. So now we have five to choose from. One of them, pretty much all of them, except one, said it's going to take about 90 days. Now, we're growing at what percent? What percent sales uh, increase are we having? 100%. We're going from 100 million to 200 million. So what happens to cash when you're growing super fast? Cash just gets eaten. It doesn't matter how much profit you have. If you're growing at 100% at those levels, you're going to eat cash. So, you know, one of them said, hey, we'll close in 30 days. And it was a Canadian firm, Sam Bellsberg, who's now dead, thank God. Um, <laughs> you'll hear why. So Sam became a billionaire uh, by doing corporate raids in the 80s. So he was a very you know, notorious or infamous character. If you Google him, uh, you know, notorious, his picture pops up. Anyway, so um, Sam, the investment banker, was excited to have the relationship because they had never done a deal with, with Sam Bellsberg, and they were excited to have another billionaire that they can you know, bring into their investment pool. So we meet with Sam, and everything's great. We, uh, his project manager um, you know, finishes the 30 days of due diligence and walks up to Philippe and says, Philippe, we're, today's Friday. We're closing on Monday. And right now, we, you have a million and a half in cash on the line of credit. So um, why don't we pay down payables and get ahead, right, so that Monday when we fund, everything's, you know, we're ahead. And uh, I'm offside. Fleep calls me. And I say, well, Fleep, your boot's on the ground. You decide. And so he, you know, he's trying to get a good relationship with Sam Bellsberg's manager. So he blows out the million and a half to pay down payables. Monday, I get a phone call. The day we're supposed to close the 20 million, I get a phone call from Sam Bellsberg. Harry, we love your firm. Everything checked out. Except over the weekend, we got a cash report. And you don't have any cash, which means you need us more than we need you. So we still want to do the deal, but we want 80% equity, not 20%. Sam, no thank you. Hang up the phone, call the, the investment banker. Say, hey, call the guys with the white hat, that, you know, that the two of my board members did a deal with. Tell, you know, call them and see, see what they can do. And remember, how fast are we growing, right? I mean, the thing is just eating cash. I personally put in a, another million and a half um, to, to, you know, feed it. And the other private equity firm says, well, Harry, we would love to move forward, but we still need 90 days. We can't, we can't shorten it. So we say, yes, let's, you know, go for it. 
So they start the due diligence, um, and after a while, the wheels are starting to wobble. Well, back in those days, private equity is a little more aggressive now in terms of what they'll accept. Back then, if your wheels wobble, private equity would not take it. That's venture capital. All of a sudden, I just painted myself right into a corner. So I scrambled for a while, and you know I remember about a month or two later, um, I'm on date night with my, my wife at the time, and we're outside a restaurant uh, in Rancho Santa Fe, California, and the phone rings, it's Sam Bellsberg saying, Harry, do you still want to do the deal? We're willing to do the deal. And my wife and I both said, you know what, we would rather go through bankruptcy than give you the company. I know how to make money. Hang up the phone. I was such an idiot. You know, I, in my head, I was Luke Skywalker, and he was Darth Vader, right? You know, I'm a Boy Scout, and, and you don't let bad guys win. That was totally the wrong attitude, because of all of the damage that happened as a result of that company having to wind down. So we ended up uh, putting the company through bankruptcy. It got liquidated. Uh, we ended up going through a personal Chapter 11, um, and the attorney's fees at that time were $100,000 a month for my personal bankruptcy. And what, what's odd is, right, in, in, so I, I, I went to business school and, you know, uh, grad school, and, you know, you're taught, hey, the worst thing that can happen in business is that you go through bankruptcy, right? And you have a fresh start. Well, we'll talk more about that in a second. So what I realized is that, and it really it took me two years, I got really pissed off because my experience, I mean, if, if that could happen to me with kind of the best education in the world, why was it that I didn't know about the various landmines that I stepped on? And then I realized that for the most part, entrepreneurial education, business education, is how to grow and scale, how to lead, you know, uh, lead your business, that, you know, that kind of thing. It, it, there wasn't really any content in the world on what are the risk factors. And, and so, uh, anyway, so my book is really the, the seminal book on risk factors. So uh, first question, this is gonna be interactive, but we have to hustle, <laughs> we have limited time. How long does it take? So if you have a pizza parlor and you go out of, you go out of business, how long does it take for the pizza parlor person to reopen their next pizza parlor? Three months? Three to six months, okay. So now, let's say you have a, you have a really successful uh, architecture, engineering, construction, whatever. You have lots of employees, lots of clients, and the same thing happens. How long does it take for you, as the entrepreneur, to be able to get back into the game? A year? Five years. What's the difference? Well, let's say it's, so in my research, nobody got out in less than five years. What's the difference? Reputation, okay, all right. Um, what's interesting is the, the larger you are, the worse it gets. Because what happens, it turns into a, and by the way, if I would have known this one thing, and that's why, I, that's why I do this, I emphasize it, this one factor 
okay, that nobody had known or published or whatever. So the bigger, the bigger your value, the worse it gets because it turns into a feeding frenzy for litigation. And it just handcuffs the entrepreneur for years and years and years. Five years was the, was the, the quickest and 12 years was the outside. So this is interesting. Who does a, you know, you know when you hire a, an attorney, they represent you and you know, same with a CPA or your doctor. So who does a bankruptcy? Let's say you're, you're meeting with a bankruptcy attorney and you've not hired them. Who do they represent? Very good. So they represent the potential future, the potential future estate to benefit the creditors. They can be disbarred if they give you advice that hurts the potential future estate to benefit the creditors. Think about that. You're going to an attorney to help you and your family. And by the way, they will never tell you that. They will absolutely not tell you that they, they have a conflict to help you and your family over the estate for, to benefit the creditors. Wild. And I, I speak, so I've spoken in 80 cities, 30 countries, think about that, 30 countries all around the world, and it's pretty much the same. But most people never, never realize it. So sometimes it can feel like we're on our own, especially if you're in the C-suite. So I interviewed 30, 30 entrepreneurs that made and lost 10 to 200 million, recorded the, um, the, the interviews, correlated the risk factors, and that's the book, by Risk Factor. So um, I'm, I'm gonna go through three other stories real quick. The first is Brad Adams, brilliant guy, CEO of Solid State Stamping that he bought from his, his dad's estate. He started at 26 years old, um, grew it steadily for 20 years. And uh, they, they did stampings for airbags, so everything had to be perfect. Um, so he's growing the company, again, for 20 years, and he, he's looking for some something to add value to the employees and, and more profit to the bottom line. So he thinks, okay, if I get, acquire a, a plastic injection molding company, integrate the pin in it, we can sell it as a full component rather than just a part. So right down the street, it just so happens there's a plastic injection molding company. Um, <clears throat> and so he goes to them, they're interested in selling, but the price is too high, the cash flow doesn't justify the price. So they, they continue to talk. A year goes by, same. Price is too high, cash flow doesn't justify it. Third year, huh, the cash flow's increased and it justifies the price. So he hires Ernst & Young to do due diligence and also an M&A firm. They do all sorts of analysis, all the due diligence, and under every single scenario, a fully leveraged acquisition uh, works just fine. So they have uh, bank debt, a mezzanine uh, uh, financing layer, and then seller financing. So 100%, no cash down purchase, um, and they close, everything's fine. After the first 30 days, all that cash flow was gone. Another 30 days, that incremental cash flow from the third year was gone. So he brings in a forensic accountant who finds out that the fourth largest client had given 18 months notice that they were pulling out and the company jacked up the prices to that fourth company and that was the increment of cash flow. Poof. So for two or three years, he's running it 
like a turnaround, his company that he's had for 20 years is guaranteeing all the debt for the, for the acquisition. And the mezzanine finance company ends up initiating a voluntary bankruptcy and in the auto industry, bam, it just wiped out the whole company like that, overnight. What lessons did you hear? Real quick, what, what, what went wrong? What, what lessons? What, what should have been done differently? Speak up. Right, not, so not sufficient due diligence going down. By the way, he called the top three. Can you imagine the seller said, oh, here, here's our top three clients, give them a call, right? I, I, I'm sure that happened. What else? Leverage, right? All debt. So, I mean, really what I found in my, in my uh, research is any time you had that kind of a structure was pretty much a, a good recipe for disaster. So, moving on, um, the second is Mike Brown, CEO of Brown Family Communities, another just uh, wonderful uh, man. So, Brown Family Communities was founded by his dad. His dad grew it to $100 million in, in sales. Uh, Mike started, you know, just sweeping the floors. Um, and, you know, ultimately, um, his dad, after about $100 million, said, hey, you know, why don't you, you know, come in and, and take over? So Mike became CEO, implemented processes, grew it to $300 million, uh, in sales and, and did you know, really, really well. They had 300 employees. Um, and about this time, they get an unsolicited offer from a large public home builder for $240 million to acquire the company. So you know, Mike calls his dad, who has now retired to his ranch in Colorado, and says, hey, dad, we have an offer for $240 million. What do you think? And his dad says, you know, I, I don't think so. I think, you know, I think we can do better. As a matter of fact, how about if I come back as CEO and, and we'll keep growing, I, I'll keep growing this firm? Mike says, wait a second, you're retired? No way. If you buy me out, um, yeah, okay, then, then that's fine. But, but I, I can't work with you at this point. So his dad gives him a huge down payment um, and is, is going to pay him out over three years. So with the down payment, Mike buys a, a, a second jet, a home in Cabo, a second yacht. So he has yachts on, on both sides of the, the U.S. And... <clears throat> And you know he's every you know everything's good. He has a bunch of friends that are recommending uh, investing in development projects. So he's the money behind him and guaranteeing all these development projects. Um, and then about six months after closing, the the business starts slowing down. The dad sees a recession coming and he unwinds the business. And he tells Mike, hey. Uh, you know those uh, other installments? They're not going to happen. I can tell you there weren't good Thanksgiving family uh, dinners for a while. Mike ends up uh, writing $10 million in after-tax money to get out of personal guarantees for some of the projects, and literally for the next 10 years is, is unwinding everything. So what lessons did you hear in that? Quite a few. Don't do business with family, right? And what's the percent of family business? Zero, right, yeah. You'll learn. <laughs> anyway, what else? That, that's good. What else? I'm sorry? No one to exit. No one to exit? Okay. What, how, about, how about others? Right. Don't spend so much, right? <laughs> right? Right? What else? The 
Right. Yes, he, all the personal guarantees for the development projects, super high risk, no, you know, and he obviously not diversified. The last story, Bob Verdun, uh, another brilliant guy, founder of Computer Facility Integrators. Uh, he was about a 15 million in sales. He did real estate uh, systems for Fortune 100 companies around the world, uh, about 150 employees. <clears throat> and uh, the, this is in 1999, uh, he's doing great. He gets an unsolicited letter to, offer, uh, to buy the company for 25 million uh, in October of 99. And he, you know, he's like, God, you know, I think, I think we're, we can do better. So he says no to that. And then in December of 99, he starts, his phone starts ringing. It's his prospective client saying, hey, we don't want to cancel our contract, but things are going a little weird right now. Remember, you know, Y2K and all that. Um, for some of you don't, don't remember that, but anyway... <laughs> Anyway, so um, he, he, they were saying, hey, let's put it on hold. Well, he had leases, he had payroll, because you know they weren't saying hold it for two years. They were just saying put it on hold for right now. And so by October of, of, of 2000, he ends up um, uh, flushing the company through bankruptcy. And for seven years, he's pay, repaying the creditors. Very, very painful. So... Between these three entrepreneurs, 400 million in personal wealth demolished, 20 years of hard work each, and about 1,000 employees that were impacted. So I can't change their stories, but hopefully I can help you a little bit on yours. Uh, so re reviewing quickly the three lessons. First, there's no place at all for optimism with acquisitions. According to a study published by Harvard, 80% of all acquisitions fail. And I, I've been speaking all over the world, and pretty much companies that do lots of acquisitions, they pretty much all will concur about 80% fail. Um, and so what, what are the, what, what do you think the number one, there are two real important reasons as to why acquisitions don't work. Number one is what? what do you, or what, what do you think the two are? Losing top it, really interesting. That, that's probably related. Okay. So you think you're making an acquisition to get top talent? According to the study, within two years, two-thirds of your leadership team are gone. Whoa! Within two years, two-thirds of the leadership team are gone, whether you've let them go or they've decided to leave, which is probably related in large part to culture. Culture is the number two reason for acquisitions to fail. The number one is somewhat esoteric. It's strategy. And I'm going to run this by you because I, I'm making this up, but having done acquisitions myself. And by the way, 54% of you have done an acquisition. The, the top companies for this year 100% have done acquisitions. So is this a germane topic for this crowd? Heck yeah. So I'm going to spend a, a couple of minutes on it. So the number one issue is strategy. All right. So let's say I'm an architectural firm, and um, there's, a, there's an architectural firm in this, the same metropolitan area that does the same stuff. Okay, we serve the same general, uh, we work in the same general kind of projects. Okay, strategically, that would not be a, a strategic move, even though it's very common. So let's say um, 
uh, we, we have a firm in Dallas that, you know, we specialize in uh, healthcare. And there's a firm in Austin that does a little bit of healthcare, but they do a whole bunch of uh, in, uh, government, in, uh, uh, higher ed, uh, right, university uh, projects, okay? That would actually be a more strategic move, okay? Because then you can take your clients, you can cross, you know, cross over your clients, you have some ge geographic diversity, you have diversity of industry. Um, so anyway, my, the, the point is, number one uh, reason acquisitions don't fail, strategy, number two is culture. Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go back. So real quick, All right. this is the normal, uh, the normal meeting before the acquisition, right? Team, this is so exciting. We're going to acquire this company. And in doing so, we're going to all get our bonuses for the year. I mean, I really think this is very exciting. So during our due diligence, let's make sure that we form good relationships with them and, and we make this happen. Okay, that is very, very normal. Doesn't matter what industry, okay? So now I'm gonna show you, we're, we're gonna have a little vignette here of how I would recommend being informed. Hey team, this is really super exciting. So, you know, we only have a 20% chance of getting this right. Okay, 80% of acquisitions don't work. So, you know, obviously let's, let's you know, build some relationships uh, because they'll last forever. But importantly, let's look for red flags. Let's, let's look for cultural nuances that, that might be landmines. Let's look for the real strategy behind what we're doing. And also, uh, wasn't it, was it Chad? that brought up the chief strategy officer, right? You see the importance given this, right? Do, strategically, does the acquisition make sense? All right, let's move on. So 54% of you. So you, know, you can never do enough due diligence, but you, know, you can only do so much. Uh, so you know, verifying revenue, but profoundly be Fundamentally pessimistic, because you know m most of the time CEOs are you know we're we're the cheerleaders right we're optimists okay and hey that's great we we live longer we're healthier um, we're more fun at parties okay but we suck when it comes to acquisitions okay so lesson number two this is uh, Mike Brown um, reduce risks um, including personal guarantees. 49% of you have personal guarantees, okay? That's the number one risk factor as an entrepreneur. The number one is having personal guarantees. That's what killed me. So um, for Mike Brown, and, and again, I'm going to move on quickly with this, but for family businesses, governance is really important. And I think for a lot of your firms, governance is probably really important. And, and his, his company had none. And then also diversification, right? So then Bob Verdun, this is, this is pretty exciting, and we'll see where it goes with you guys. So your best friend in business is diversified ongoing revenue. Okay, and diversifying revenue by customer, geography, and industry. So that means, and this is a mindset change, shifting from one-time project work to ongoing revenue. Um, let me give you an example. The very best construction companies in the world, they uh, target having 20% of their total revenue being recurring revenue. What is that for a construction company? 
maintenance, okay? So air conditioning, fire sprinklers, asphalt pavement, uh, um, landscaping, okay? Cleaning companies, okay? So imagine that, the most sophisticated or some of the most sophisticated construction companies, they, they shifted so that 20% of their, their revenue is, are these maintenance service companies. Pretty amazing because, believe it or not, the profit, first of all, they're resilient, and secondly, the profit that they generate is almost the same as the 80% in their core business. So think about how that might apply to you. <clears throat> so Bob Verdun, again, amazing. He, he, in 1999, he was 90% one-time project-based, shifted it to recurring, and uh, he's since sold his business for, uh, I'm sure, an incredible amount of money. Um, and, but it was all strategic, and it was because he, he did not want to go through another down period where he had to basically let a lot of people go and, and you know, create unemployment. So w when you're an entrepreneur, you have to be like Superman, you're a risk taker, but once you've attained success and you have a larger entity, you have to, you know, it's important to shift your mindset to that of a risk manager. So again, risk taker, ego driven, risk manager, kind of you're watching out for the community. What I found, and we're not going to go through these, but we'll, uh, Chad and his team will, will send out the slides. There are people all over the world um, that have these, they print them out, they laminate them, and they put them in their, their briefcase, and with their meetings with their attorneys and, and, and accountants, they pull them out. And I've had three people sell their businesses because they basically felt like they checked off every single box. Okay, but amazingly, 19 business risk factors, eight personal risk factors, which is weird. You wouldn't think they're important, but they sure as heck are. Um, and number one, personal guarantees, and 49% of you have personal guarantees. Let me, let me spend a minute on that. Okay, I was uh, speaking at uh, Pittsburgh. <clears throat> oh, well, let me, let me back... Yeah, let me, let me back up. So, um, so this is what I recommend because the, the mindset of entrepreneurs is I'm an entrepreneur, I have to have um, personal guarantees, okay? And I assure you it's a mindset and you're handcuffing yourself and putting your family at risk, okay? So I'm going to demonstrate the conversation with the banker. Your name is? Caitlin. Caitlin. Caitlin, you know, I've really appreciated the relationship we've had. You've been a great banker for the last eight years. You've really helped my firm. Um, however, I, I, I just got advised that my emphasis needs to be on my family and I really can't go home to my spouse and let her know that we could lose our home, we could, she could lose her car. And so, first of all, you know, there are lots of you know, entities willing to, to lend money, but more importantly, I would like to continue our relationship. We need to set a plan for how, first, we carve out the home and the car and whatever dishwasher and from, from the guarantee so that I can go home and, and make sure she's covered. And then I also want to have a plan for how I can totally eliminate the guarantee. That, and I'm telling you, and I've had people actually do that over and over again, and it works, okay? Um, you don't have to have the mindset, hey, Mike Brown, the, the home builder, he's a home builder today, not one personal guarantee, 
okay? It's a mindset. Um, and secondly, I spoke in Pittsburgh, 350 people. A banker comes up to me and he says, oh God, Harry, that was great. You know, you are so right. I'm, I'm a commercial banker. Just last week, a great client of ours renewed his line of credit. If he would have asked, I would have released it, but he never asked. Jeez. Anyway, I have a chapter in my book uh, called Your Banker is Not Your Friend. They might be nice. Hey, you know what? It's been great, but, <laughs> but you work for the bank, not for me. All right, so I found these 13 best practices. Again, look at them and go through and, and figure out how, how they apply to you. But basically, um, once, you know, when, when we're young and entrepreneurial, we have to change our mindsets once we be become successful. The best business book ever written, uh, but it's a horrible read, uh, is is Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, but it is the most, the most important business book. Mine's important, but in a different way. Uh, his is fantastic. Understanding the importance of luck. So when things go bad, it's like, oh, shoot. Oh, that was some bad luck. But when things go well, it's like, yes, I'm brilliant. Our strategy was fantastic. It doesn't work that way, <laughs> okay? You, we have good luck and bad luck. And a lot of really amazing things that happen are just luck, whether you call it luck or, or fate or destiny, whatever label, um, it's, not, it's not because of our brilliance. With that, I have one last question. So what company was going to be sold for just under a million dollars, but, but was not because the buyer backed out. I'm sorry? Microsoft, Amazon, nope. Uber, nope. So imagine, just under a million dollars. How about Google? So this is one of the, it's worth 1.6, Seven trillion right now, and they they almost sold it for just under a million dollars. And can you imagine at that time that was probably bad luck? They probably said, "Oh shoot, I was going to pay off my wife's minivan, right?" <laughs> oh, anyway. So uh, thank you very much, and and I think we have uh, some time for Q and A, right? So, any uh, questions, comments? Yes. Did you ever make your money back? Um, okay, interesting. <laughs> so the question was, did I ever make the, my money back? So in my research, there were three groups of, of um, entrepreneurs. Those that, like, the most important thing in the world was making it back, and, and they did or more. The next group was like, God, after all that time, I love my family. <laughs> you know, you know, like ten millions enough. <laughs> you know that kind of thing. And uh, the third group were in transition, so they didn't know where where they were. And I'm I'm definitely the second. I mean, I you know, for me, it's like, you know, because when you when you finally realize how little you really need to sustain a, a you know a a nice lifestyle, it, it's, it's amazing. Then why, you know, I have no interest in putting all my chips in it, you know, ever again. But great question, thank you. Questions? Yes. Yeah, very good question. Thank you for asking. So the definition of a fail, failed acquisition is a failure to increase shareholder value. Okay, so you know you spend fifty thousand, and it returns forty thousand. Yeah. It seems like some of what you, what you highlighted there was possibly mistaken that uh, 
uh, offer was made on the company and they decided not to do that? How often does that, that You know, it, 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 uh, it would appear to be a theme. And there was quite, you know, quite a bit of that. Okay, so I mentioned the number one risk factor is personal guarantees. No, 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 risk factors, personal guarantees, right? But the, the number one personal issue is um, uh, overconfidence, right? Optimists, right? Fun at parties, but, you know, not good. That, and that's why the importance of a real rock star conservative CFO that you listen to is immeasurable. Okay, so exuberance, you know, over optimism. How many of those failed acquisitions restarted and reincarnated themselves? I, you know, I don't know the number on it. Um, so what? Let me tell you what you'll find, and and I'm sure there are lots of people here that have done a ton of acquisitions. What frequently happens is, you know, you, you say, okay, hey, you know, I'm going to, uh, Ezekiel, I'm going to buy your company. You're going to have your own P&L, uh, your own balance sheet for, you know, five years. And after the first year, it's like, oh, jeez, man, they are tanking. So we, we're just going to absorb you into our company, and we're not going to have separate financials. I mean, that happens all the time. So, so I would say that's more likely than, than them leaving, right? If that makes sense. Oh, how, wait, what, one thing. However, the two thirds of the leadership team that leave within two years, yeah, them setting up a competing firm, heck yeah. <laughs> Does that happen? Yes. Yep. Yeah, so the question is that on, on one of the charts, having a highly complicated business model is a risk factor. And um, yeah, keeping it, keeping it simple. I mean, if you can, have, you can have it be a little complex, but if it's too complex, um, yeah, it's a real issue. The other thing is, you know, innovation. A lot of you, I'm assuming, are doing public, you know, public projects. Right, government of some kind, local, state, local, you know, federal. Um, you know, you don't want to innovate very much with with government. It does not. I mean, read my book. My God, I mean, in Texas, the scooter store. Oh, geez. Yeah, you don't. You don't. You know, don't play around with the government with innovation. Not much. Be careful. Okay. Other questions. Yep. Yeah, curious if there's a different success fail rate for acquisitions if they're uh, inside your core service offering or you're trying to expand into a new service offering. I I don't know the statistics on that. Um, I I yeah I don't. Sorry. I yeah. yeah. Uh, other other questions. Great. Well, oh, well, I'm sorry. Yep. Looking back, if you had to do it all over again, would you have maybe slowed down growth? Yeah. If you had to do it all over again, would you have slowed down growth from 100%? So maybe you didn't need PE, or would you have taken PE for the 80%? Yeah, so my <clears throat> um, absolutely yes. Okay. Um, and, and there were so many mistakes that. that you know, that I made. One was my CFO, although he was amazing, he was the wrong guy. He, w he worked as a subsidiary guy, so cash was never an issue, okay? So I needed a cash, you know, a construction cash guy, not Solomon Sports and Callaway Golf, <laughs> you know? Very different, number one. Number two, absolutely, I would have throttled back growth to... In, in given our size, we could have, you know, probably easily done 30 to 50 percent, but boy, over 50 percent 
growth year over year for any business, you know, I, I, I throw up as a red flag. Um, and if you're a really large business, I, I think Chad was saying 20% or so uh, growth, right, year over year for the, for the larger, yeah. Um, I, 20% is good. Much more than that, you're going to start losing quality. You're going to start losing, you know, culture, right? Uh, so 20, 30%. After that, you know, after that, it's it's tough to maintain it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, definition of a weak CFO: number one is if they don't somehow get in the face of the leadership team and really have have their attention and respect, right? Because if the leadership team doesn't respect the CFO, they're not going to, they're going to blow them off. Um, and um, also uh, having the right fit. So if a larger company cannot afford on, on the job training for a CFO, especially if you're growing or shrinking, <laughs> right? If, if you're a 10 year old firm that hasn't had any change in, you know, four years, that, that would be okay. Um, but like a good fit, like again, in, in our case, um, I had my, my leadership team interview the, the two CFOs. We had a choice of a construction cash guy who was rough versus Philippe, you know, Parisian, you know, French cuffed, Solomon Calloway, right? Everyone said, oh, he's the right guy. I, I literally was saying, oh God, but I think we need him. I ended up going with Philippe because the team, you know, it's a team decision. It's not my decision, but it was the wrong decision. You know, I mean, right for the team, but wrong for the for the company. If that helps. Any other questions? <clears throat> you know, he he was he was. I think so. Would they have liked him? No. But would they have respected him? Yes. Whereas Philippe, he was liked and, you know, and, and respected. Yeah. 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 Any other? Uh, yes. Can you clarify your three uh, factors for failing acquisition? I have strategy, culture, and third. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah. So number one is strategy in order, right? Number one is strategy. Number two is culture. The third is anecdotal related to culture, which is that, hey, you think you're doing an acquisition to gain a leadership team, and two-thirds of them statistically are gone in two years. Yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't actually a third, but, but it's vital, right? Because, it, you, you know, when you... When you when you have your team and you're saying, hey, this isn't about the team, right? Because statistically, we're going to lose two-thirds of them. And maybe, and maybe then it's, hey, let's look who's behind the, the leadership team to see if, if they have internal replacements because we have to plan on two-thirds of them leaving, even though we're going to try like heck to make the culture work, right? Any other questions? You guys are good. Great questions. Yeah. Uh, equity and all that normally to inspire and make sure that you're, you succeed post-transaction. <clears throat> yeah. So, so it's interesting. Um, how many, a show of hands, how many of you been, have been through an acquisition where Okay, all right. So the, the difficulty is what's promised during the meetings and the result are very different, okay? I, a very good friend of mine just sold his uh, Salesforce company for like 80 million. And, and he's, the only reason he's still there is he's got like a $25 million bump that comes in May that his, his team gets like, 15 million of it, 
Okay, that's the only reason he's there. He can't stand it. He, it's like everything the, the acquiring company does is totally against his values, okay? And, and so it has, you know, I don't know. That's where the culture, it's, and it can be little things. It can be e- an email that was sent out by somebody from the acquiring company to your, your team members with the wrong tone, right? I mean, it's, it, it's the culture, as we all know, it, it runs really, really deep. And by the way, you know, it's funny because in, in, one, in some of my talks, um, I talk about communication because I talk, uh, I do a lot in Silicon Valley and innovation. So communication leads to trust. Trust is absolutely critical for innovation. You, because to innovate, you have to take risks, but to take risks on a job, you, you have to trust that you're not going to get fired if you fail, which you're likely to fail, right? So communication builds trust. Trust builds innovation. Without innovation, you can't have a kick-ass company. So anyway, so just building on Chad. Any, yeah. So you talk about um, the personal guarantee was something you would have done differently, right? Maybe the CFO was something you would have done differently, and your growth rate would be something you did differently. So those are three big ones. Yes. What's three or four other things you would have done differently that may have made you successful? Oh, wow. So those are really, um, let me see. I mean, that, that's, that's real, those are really the... The, the key things. I mean, our company was amazing. I mean, it, it was absolutely an amazing, you know, we had all the best people. I mean, and, you know, people were flocking to work there because we had this reputation of, of you know, doing some great things. Throttling back really singularly was, would have been the most important thing. You know, unfortunately, having some tech background and service company background, you know, my thought was, oh, you can scale anything, you know, and it doesn't, construction's not, not quite the same. Yeah, you guys would have loved to see my, the modular plant that we built. I mean, it was just phenomenal. We did multi-story all uh, ordinary moment frame, slab on grade, uh, super, super high-end uh, stuff. But uh, any other? Yeah. Is, is anyone else? Is, yeah. Is anyone else doing what you innovated then? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I haven't followed it, but I don't think like we did at all. No, no. Uh, because it took it took a while. We were talking, uh, Michael uh, and I were. T- Michael's from Tulsa, uh, and he's the uh, operations manager for his uh, A and E firm. Um, and we, we were talking about how sometimes other architectural firms hire his engineers, right? Well, that's kind of how what we had to do. We had. Uh, 12 architects and about 40 design people, um, and they had to gain the trust of the uh, school district architects that we weren't going to come in and and you know take the take the work away, which is a really interesting dynamic, you know if you've if you've done it. Yes, yeah, over. Harry, you mentioned uh, that you know 50% growth year over year is not really sustainable, but then then you you said sort of you know. Your uh, experience with a service industry, maybe, maybe it is. It, 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 is it or? Is it? So the difference, the difference is, is that service companies don't eat as much cash. You pretty much have to, like, when you're hiring your team members, you need like six months before they start paying for themselves, right? Whereas when you're hiring, you know, a hundred construction people, right? The cash, the cash is, you know, it, it, it's, 
it's a long tail on, on that cache. So um, anyway, so that's the difference is it's, it's quicker and easier to scale with less cash, less risk inherently. However, as I mentioned before, qual you still have quality issues, customer issues, culture issues that are, that are going to plague you if you grow too fast. Yep. And talk a little bit about the, the evolution of leadership in a company from that early entrepreneur that's got the enthusiasm. How does that person decide when it's time to hand off to the next phase of leadership who's going to be that more stable? Yeah, wow, that's a, that's a real tough, uh, tough one. Um, what, I can, what I can tell you, having studied this quite a bit, is the very best thing and it's really hard if you're the first generation, right, of, of entrepreneur where you started the company, um, it would be to actually develop what, you know, as an entrepreneur, right, you, you develop the company to represent your values. I mean, that's just the way it works. Um, so, for example, if you walk into a company and you know right away you feel the culture is horrible, well, <laughs> it normally represents the, the you know, whoever is leading the, the company uh, and vice versa if it's a great, com you know, great company. Um, so um, what, what I've seen, the very best I've seen is uh, this business out of, um, it's like Cleveland, uh, Cleveland area. Uh, it's actually a design build company doing assisted living, <clears throat> where you know basically they they have they they built this model where for basically ten years they're grooming somebody, their CEO for ten years, and then they serve at the behest of the new CEO replacement for ten years but only if that CEO wants them. And so, in other words, it was thoughtful, it was engineered, and everybody knows it, which is kind of cool. Very rarely, I mean, I'm, I, you know, hundreds and hundreds of companies, and I've seen it that fantastic once. And then a, a, a cognac company in France that had a also intriguing, but it was that's a family business versus, you know, a professionally run business. But but basically, ideally, the the entrepreneur figures out what their values are and they develop a plan and it's a succession plan. And I, ideally, it would be institutionalized for the company so that it could be replicated over and over again. Any last questions? Great, wonderful. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to the Zweig Letter Podcast. We hope that you can be part of elevating the industry and that you can apply our advice and information to your daily professional life. For a free digital subscription to the Zweig Letter, please visit thezweigletter.com slash subscribe to gain more wisdom and inspiration in addition to information about leadership, finance, HR, and marketing your firm. Subscribe today.